joining us on Zoom. If you'll just give us a moment for everyone to load into the Zoom room, we will get started momentarily. Good morning and welcome to those of you joining us on Zoom. If you'll just give us a moment for everyone to load into the Zoom room, we'll get started momentarily. Good morning and welcome to today's event on worker-centered trade and inclusive trade policy. This is the fourth event we've held this year looking at these issues and we're glad so many of you are here with us today. We've got a busy couple of weeks of programming ahead, starting next week when we host Congressman Jimmy Gomez, a member of the House Ways and Means Trade Subcommittee for a one-on-one -on -one interview with the American Leadership Initiative. The following week, we're doing a deep dive on trade, sustainability, and the circular economy. That's the fourth event in our series on trade and the environment. We're pleased that the director of the WTO's Trade and Environment Division, Aiko Lim, will join us for that session from Geneva. You can find information about all our events, including our 2021 annual dinner, which is already 80% sold out. All that information is on our webpage, www.wita.org. Before we dive deep on today's event, I'd like to give a shout out to some of the people you are in community with at today's Zoom session, even if you can't see them on camera. So welcome today to Keith, Keith Schneller with the Almond Board of California, Kristen Hansen with the Embassy of Norway, Kasia Witkowski at HP, and Ken Kurakawa at KDanren USA. Welcome Keith, Kristen, Kasia, Ken, and welcome to all of you. If you're watching this on Zoom, you can ask questions using the Q&A function on Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can before the end of our session. You should have received a copy of our panelist biographies by email earlier this morning, so we don't need lengthy introductions of our speakers. But welcome back to the WIDA stage to Laura Boffman and Scott Paul, and welcome to two new guests to the WIDA stage, Professor Gordon Hansen of Harvard University and Eric Gottwald of the AS AFL CIO. Welcome as well to my good friend, Alex Perkins, who will moderate today's discussion. Alex? Thanks, Ken, for the opportunity to moderate this great panel. Welcome, everyone. Today, as Ken noted, we are going to try and unpack what constitutes a worker-centered worker inclusive trade policy. In the past, we've heard policymakers tout similar approaches, but at least rhetorically, none have done so with the laser focus of Ambassador Tai and her team at USTR. But what exactly is a worker-centered and inclusive trade policy? In the ambassador's defense, it is still early days at USTR. We will certainly get a better sense of what she means and how she intends to translate these themes into actual trade policy in the coming weeks and months. But in the meantime, we have four experts with us today to discuss what they think a worker-centered inclusive trade policy can and should look like. Laura, Eric, Scott, Gordon, thank you so much for being here with us today. So why don't we jump right in? Gordon, you recently published a piece in Foreign Affairs entitled, Can Trade Work for Workers? Can you give us a brief summary of your conclusions, including why you suggest the U.S. should join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, and why manufacturing jobs lost to China aren't coming back to the U.S.? Thanks very much, Alex, and, and thanks for including me on this, on this great panel. Um, the piece I wrote in Foreign Affairs uh, grew out of research I've been doing for the last 10 years with David Otter at MIT and David Dorn at the University of Zurich, in which we've been looking at the impacts of US trade with China on the American worker. Um, we draw kind of two big conclusions from this. One is not so shocking. Trade does some good things for the US as a whole, uh, and on net, that those, those good things are positive. But it's not good for everybody. Uh, Trade has caused concentrated job loss in the smaller cities and towns that became specialized in manufacturing over the course of the 20th century. Uh, places like North Hickory, North Carolina, which 1990 had about 400,000 people. It had almost 50% of its workforce uh, employed in manufacturing, making furniture, making textiles, which was a great thing. Uh, but it left place, uh, a place like North Hickory vulnerable to any sudden increase in imports that came from a country that comes along and, and suddenly establishes a dominant role on the global stage. That is what China did. Due to the speed and scale of its economic reforms and the immense size of the Chinese economy, 
combined with its narrow comparative advantage at the start in labor-intensive manufacturing, China's emergence caused concentrated job loss in many American towns and cities. To our surprise, workers who lost those jobs didn't leave those communities uh, uh, by and large. What that meant was that manufacturing joblessness turned into overall joblessness that has persisted out to 2019, research that we just completed uh, shows. So what do you do about this? Um, we're gonna talk a lot more about this today. I would highlight two things. First, any trade policy has to be prepared to deal with concentrated job loss. And our policies today are not set up uh, to do so. The second thing is to think about in, uh, encouraging long run adjustment uh, to changes that, uh, that trade policy can bring. And that's about trying to create jobs where people are rather than relying on people to move uh, to where jobs currently happen, uh, happen to be. On this question of um, why the manufacturing jobs uh, aren't coming back, you know, China accelerated a process that was, that was going slowly or relatively slowly, and that was this transition of the U.S. Um, out of certain manufacturing sectors. Because of the way in which um, uh, those sectors have become much more capital intensive over time, any return of that production to the U.S. is unlikely to generate much in terms uh, of dot gains. So we need to be forward looking. I think TPP could be part of that. Much more important are uh, establishing a set of domestic policies that are oriented towards bringing opportunities to workers where they are. Great, Gordon, uh, thank you for that summary. Laura, Scott, Eric, would you like to share your thoughts on Gordon's paper and his recommendations? Oh, Laura, you're still muted. Goodness, I think if people, that's gonna be the, that's gonna be the refrain from the Zoom, the Zoom life we've been in, you're still muted, <laughs> apologies. Um, I, I agree, I agree with um, everything you say, Dr. Hansen. Um, I, unfortunately, yes, it is true that a lot of uh, manufacturing jobs have been lost to trade, uh, to trade with uh, China and those jobs are not coming back. The, um, the, the, the solution is, is really what matters, you know, and, and that's where we do need to focus our attention and our, our efforts. And that entails a lot of making um, um, assistance, helping those workers find other jobs better. Um, and in particular, learning the kinds of skills, digital skills that they're gonna need for the new jobs of the 21st century. There are millions of non-production jobs out there that are available to workers who have at best a high school diploma and pay as much if not more than manufacturing jobs. Um, they're in, in services sectors, they're in warehousing and transportation and construction and a whole host of other sectors that we tend not to think about, but you can, you can make a middle-class living with a high school degree in these jobs if you have the right skills. So we need to figure, figure out a way to train those workers if they won't move um, to get them into those jobs. Thanks, Laura. Scott? Thanks, Alex. And first, I want to acknowledge the important contribution that uh, Gordon and his colleagues made to the understanding of trade and job loss. I think that it was a number of us have been uh, having a conversation about this for decades. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, the the seminal work that they published uh, helped to shed even more light on that. Uh, some much over overdue light, uh, in, in my estimation. Uh, I want to tackle three subjects here very quickly. One is this this idea of comparative advantage uh, that exists in China. And I, I think that it's not that simple. Um, fewer manufacturing jobs are being decided on a labor cost basis. And the role that the Chinese state played in uh, escalating uh, the the market share gains by Chinese manufacturers, Cannot be understated. It cannot be understated, and is unnatural. I mean, trillions of dollars of government subsidy, hundreds of billions of dollars of documented intellectual property theft, forced technology transfer, uh, exploited labor, uh, and uh, the massive amount of carbon and other types of pollution. All of these are external externalities that are not factored into the manufacturing price. And so, I do think that trade policy moving forward has to tackle all of that. And if it does successfully 
tackle all of that, I think that you will achieve a more level playing field for American workers. Second is the notion that those manufacturing jobs aren't coming back. And uh, Gordon, on some level, may be correct that they're not coming back in that exact form in some nostalgic kind of Trumpian notion of manufacturing in the 1950s. But that's not to say we can't be adding lots of manufacturing jobs in the United States. We can. In fact, from 2010, uh, up until about 2018, 2019, we added uh, well over a million manufacturing jobs in our economy. That's despite relentless automation uh, and fierce global competition. And so if we have a set of policy measures in place, uh, if we're able to somewhat abet uh, currency and other factors, uh, we can make gains in manufacturing. And just third, very briefly, is this idea of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I completely disagree. I think that would be looking back at our trade policy. That was an agreement that was written by and for multinational corporations. Uh, Rob Scott at the Economic Policy Institute estimates that it would uh, cost about 900,000 uh, American jobs, most of those in manufacturing. Even the studies that supported the TPP showed manufacturing job loss. I think that's the wrong way to go. I do think that we ought to be engaged, uh, but that workers need a seat at the table uh, when those rules were being written and the TPP was not the way to go. Thanks, Scott. Eric, Eric anything you'd like to add? Yeah, um, thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, just to echo, I, I think mainly to echo Scott's last point, um, the the TPP is, is sort of a, you know, it, it's since we left the agreement, um, in some ways on labor, it's gotten worse. Um, the US, US involvement at the table when the agreement is being negotiated uh, you know, did have you know a, a positive part of that was us really, um, you know, requiring Vietnam and Malaysia to uh, reform some of their uh, abusive labor laws and practices. Uh, but uh, when we left, unfortunately, I mean, I'm, and I'm glad we left to be clear for all the points that Scott makes. Um, but a lot of that was sort of cast aside without the U.S. there. Uh, so the idea of going back in um, is you know, uh, I don't think is, is, is the best um, way forward at, at, at this point. Got it, thank you, thank you, Eric. All right, well, why don't we move on to the next question, unless anyone has anything further. Uh, Laura, I'm gonna turn to you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, you recently published a paper funded by a number of industry associations analyzing the economic import, impact of imports on the US economy and US jobs. Can you talk a bit about your conclusions and how they fit into a worker-centered inclusive trade policy? Sure, thank you. Um, this was a study that my partner, Dr. Joseph Francois and I had done previously and we were updating it um, to try to get a sense of how things had changed um, in the ensuing years. What we, um, what we like to do is to take a step back and to look at the, the really big picture, you know, all of the ways in which imports affect um, American jobs, um, not just the negative impacts, because there are negative impacts in manufacturing in particular, um, but there are positive impacts of imports as well. Um, you know, there are, there are workers at ports and there are workers in design um, um, positions and, and advertising and uh, finance and wholesaling and retailing. I mean, just a whole range of, of folks who owe their jobs to imports. So the question was, when you add all these up, when you look at the, the big picture, what do you find about the job impact of imports? So we looked at 2019 and we found that net pluses minus the minuses um, you get 21 million net US jobs exist because we import. Um, this is goods and services from all countries in the world. Now, the question is, well, you know, people will say those are Walmart jobs or those are, you know, those are low paying jobs. How many of them, uh, what, what is, what is, how do we, how do we look at those jobs? What's the, the characteristics of those jobs? We found that 14 million of them pay middle, so-called middle-class wages as defined by Pew uh, Research. Um, and, and a lot of those um, are, are available to workers who have at best a high school degree. We estimate that two and a half million of those 21 million are union workers. 
Um, nearly 8 million are minorities. Um, more than 9 million are women. Um, probably 83% of that 21 million work at small or medium-sized businesses. So, so when you talk about the job effects of imports and you go big, you see that there really are a lot of positive jobs that ripple throughout the whole economy. Consequently, when you put restrictions on imports, those people pay a price. It's manufacturing workers, yes, they gain, but other people lose. And so, you know, the biggest example, the most you know, prominent example that we've seen in recently is the effect of the steel tariffs on the steel consuming workers, um, which were negative. So there are manufacturing workers that get hit there are manufacturing workers that, that lose and that benefit from imports. And so our, our message to everybody for policymakers is look at this bigger picture and make sure that you're um, taking in, into account the full range of what a, a trade policy will do to American workers broadly. Thanks, Laura. And, and before I open up to the others for their comments on, on Laura's study, I just had one follow-up for you. Uh, Beth Paltson, who's now a senior advisor to Ambassador Tai, noted in a 2020 paper she wrote for the Open Society that, and I'm gonna quote here, uh, the facile argument is that purchasing power is enhanced through cheap consumer goods. She also stated, in defending the existing rules of globalization, we focus too much on the consumer and not enough on the worker. Ambassador Tai has echoed these sentiments. How would you respond? Well, <clears throat> I would note that there are 328 million Americans who are consumers. Every American is a consumer. All 165 million workers in this country are consumers. They benefit from imports too. Uh, manufacturers and farmers are consumers. 65% of what we import is stuff used to make stuff in the United States or to grow products, fertilizer, for example. Um, so the consumer argument for imports is anything but facile. And I would also note that one goal of President Biden's economic um, executive order that he just came out with of promoting competition among American in the American economy, one goal is to create more choices and lower prices for consumers, which is in fact the consumer argument for imports. So it matters and it matters to the Biden administration. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. Gordon, Eric. Scott, would you guys like to share your thoughts on Laura's study or the relative importance of consumers versus workers? Um, sure, I will jump in. Uh, you know, I think this is kind of a central challenge in thinking about trade policy that oftentimes the gains from trade are diffuse. They're spread among the country as a whole, whereas the, the, the losses from trade are quite concentrated. Uh, and right now our, our policy has been focused on generating those diffuse gains and not really having an approach to deal with those concentrated losses. Um, and that's why I think it's kind of central to keep in mind uh, the economics of place when we think about trade policy. Um, but the, uh, you know, in terms of thinking of those gains, Laura mentioned earlier, the new industries that workers might transition into, Scott mentioned the continuing importance of, of manufacturing for the US economy. Uh, expanded trade can generate opportunities uh, along both of those lines. Just to give one example, it turns out that what data centers need are cool places with lots of water and the ability to generate energy. A lot of those places happen to be near uh, abandoned coal mines. Uh, so data centers are creating an opportunity for communities that have lost out from the decline of coal to expand into something new that's at the frontier uh, of technology. We need to be thinking about how we help uh, places make those transitions so that we don't lose the opportunity to capture those uh, diffuse but important gains from trade. Thanks, Gordon. Scott, Eric? Thanks. Um, I, I think one of the, certainly what uh, I think critics of trade crop policy um, are, are not proposing is a wall uh, to block all imports. Uh, it's rather to achieve more balance. Um, and I think balance is a lot healthier, uh, broadly speaking, for, for the United States. Uh, it, with respect to, to who has gained from imports, uh, I, would, I, I would frame it a, a little differently. I think that uh, 
unquestionably the shareholder class uh, and those who have a four-year college degree uh, have done quite well uh, under these circumstances. Uh, it's the uh, it's it's labor uh, in in particular men and women who don't have a four-year college degree uh, who have seen relative wage declines uh, and limited prospects. And I have been to uh, many of the communities that Gordon and his colleagues have studied. And what happens uh, when, that, uh, when, when that factory departs is that those workers, if they, ever, if they ever find another job again, it's likely it vastly diminished wages and benefits, uh, which does have a, an, uh, an impact on the entire community. Um, and so uh, loss prevention, layoff prevention uh, in manufacturing, uh, I think is exceptionally important. Uh, I think consumers have had a, an enormous seat at the trade table for a long time, uh, and, uh, but that's come at the expense of the worker seat. And uh, as I stated at the outset, I think what we need here uh, is more balance. And that is what I think that Ambassador Tai and her colleagues are seeking to achieve. Thanks, Scott. Eric, any comments? Yeah, um, I, you know, again, uh, you know, echoing a lot of what uh, Scott um, just said, um, I, would, I would just note that to his point about, you know, organized labor, many of our members work for companies in industries with complex supply chains. Um, and so we, you know, we, we understand the uh, the reality of global supply chains, the reality of global competition. I think where we depart from, you know, the trade orthodoxy is uh, is really about doing, you know, having policy responses and intentional policy responses to deal with, uh, you know, what we would regard as unfair competition. Um, you know, products being produced in factories where workers. Um, don't enjoy the right to organize um, and some of their other internationally recognized rights. Um, uh, I, I think if you're just, you know, if you look at things in a vacuum and weigh the benefits for consumers uh, versus harm done to workers and you say, well, there's a marginal benefit here, um, but you don't look at how the product is produced uh, overseas, I think you're just, you're missing part of the picture. Um, and I'll we'll maybe talk more about this uh, uh, down the line here. Great, thanks, Eric. All right, actually, I'm gonna to turn to you for a question, Eric. Uh, the AFL-CIO was a strong supporter of the USMCA rapid response labor mechanism, which Ambassador Tai has touted as an example of a worker-centered inclusive trade policy. In addition to the rapid response labor mechanism, what other worker-centered inclusive trade policies is the AFL-CIO proposing to refocus U.S. trade policy on American workers, for example, in key export sectors that employ thousands and thousands of union workers, including aviation and autos. Thanks, uh, Alex, for that. Uh, you know, about a, about a month ago, Ambassador Tai, you know, came to make an important speech uh, to the AFL-CIO, um, uh, you know, on the worker-centered trade policy, and she took questions uh, directly from union members across the country. I, and I guess I'm highlighting this because it, you know, a worker-centered trade policy in our view starts with this sort of intentional, meaningful engagement with, with the labor movement. Um, and, and, you know, we've largely been shut out uh, of trade policy making uh, despite being on the front lines of globalization for decades. Um, and, and I think this really had to change. And I do think this administration gets it um, and that you know, we will hopefully be involved in much deeper and regular ways um, in crafting trade policy. Um, so uh, beyond, you know, so what are we looking for for worker center trade policy? Well, you mentioned first, uh, you know, the USMCA and the rapid response mechanism. And I think that's a great example of, uh, you know, strong enforceable labor standards that are, you know, based on the ILO conventions that, you know, uh, governments, employers, uh, and workers have all agreed to and, and sort of setting a, a, fl a floor beneath global competition, right? A social floor to global competition. Um, so that, that, that's first. I mean, it, it's got a, an agreement has to have, you know, uh, strong enforceable labor standards. We were really pleased with the administration's uh, quick action under the rapid response mechanism in response to the 
uh, abuses at the GM Salau facility. Um, seeing how quickly that they were able to use that mechanism and get to a settlement uh, really was incredible. Um, and, and I think a lot of people are going to write about this mechanism and how it works um, or doesn't work over the over the coming years. Um, two things, uh, two other things quickly. Um, you know, I think our trade agreements have to create uh, more obligations for the for the companies who enjoy the benefits under the agreement. So what do I mean by that? Um, one is something we're already doing. Uh, you know, USMCA required all three countries to block uh, the import of goods made with forced labor. Uh, and that's a really a key supply chain issue. I think the ILO estimates there are 25 million people in the global economy who are uh, you know, trapped in forced labor, um, and a lot of them working in their supply chains. Um, that's a moral failure. It's also a form of unfair competition. Um, so I think our trade deals have to speak directly to that. They should uh, require companies, in our view, to conduct human rights due diligence. Uh, you know, based on the OECD guidelines or the UN guiding principles. Again, these consensus standards for responsible business conduct. Our trade deals should be encouraging, requiring companies to do these things in order to get the benefits uh, of the deal. Um, and, you know, lastly, beyond a labor chapter, you know, we, we're looking for, you know, strong rules of origin to encourage domestic production and employment. Um, you know, enforceable disciplines against currency manipulation, industrial subsidies, uh, other things, you know, other strategies our competitors have employed uh, to capture industries uh, and gain market share at the expense of our producers uh, and workers. I think this, this last bit fits really nicely with the administration's focus um, on Buy America, uh, with its focus as well on uh, the strategic reshoring of, 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 of important supply chains. So. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. Great. Thank, thanks for that thoughtful response, Eric. Gordon, Laura, Scott, um, please share your reactions to Eric's proposed policies. I don't know if we have a established order going. Uh, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, Eric raises the, the central point of um, how global supply chains are managed will be essential for impacts on workers in the US and, and other places. And the central challenge there is China, um, as, as Scott mentioned earlier. Uh, now, I, would, I might characterize China's kind of export boom as having two distinct phases. The one was kind of a frontier capitalism phase in which there were lots of small industries without funding from state banks that moved into apparel and shoes and uh, ballpoint pens and, and other stuff. Phase two is very much the one that Scott described in which the state has played, the Chinese state has played a central role and is trying to really control the rules of the game. Um, now that's turning global as China is losing uh, uh, labor cost advantage in a bunch of its uh, traditionally strong industries and moving into Vietnam, trying to move into Africa through Ethiopia um, and other parts of, uh, of South and Southeast Asia. So we need an approach that addresses the central role that China is playing in the continuing redesign of global value chains. I think trade agreements have to be part of that. We have to bring partners along. We have to offer our partners something so that they're going to team with us rather than doing what Vietnam is doing now, uh, which is becoming a place that assembles uh, inputs coming out of China. Thanks, Gordon. Scott, do you want to respond? Sure, I'll I'll pick up on a point Gordon made, and then uh, then also uh, comment comment on Eric's points. Um, I I I I think that uh, Gordon is right is that we need to seek high standard agreements uh, with partners uh, who are like minded uh, about these issues, but we shouldn't sacrifice our values uh, and our standards to do that. Uh, but I, I also think there needs to be an enforcement uh, or, if you will, a punitive approach uh, with respect to the, 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 the reach of the Chinese state uh, into, uh, into global competition, which has severely misaligned uh, a number of markets. Um, and I think that that has to go hand in hand. Um, I think that Eric hit the nail on the head uh, with respect to uh, the, the, the role of workers. Um, I do think it is possible to achieve uh, high standard agreements. Uh, I mean, I think the USMCA uh, is a starting point for that. Uh, I think more progress 
can be made. Um, and uh, those of you who have uh, spent a lot of times on these WIDA, WIDA panels or seminars will remember, uh, you know, former Congressman Sandy Levin's kind of three-legged stool of trade policy, one being trade expansion, uh, one being trade enforcement, and one being uh, trade adjustment. Um, I do think that those uh, th that we need serious upgrades uh, with respect to adjustment and enforcement. Uh, the the trade expansion has been uh, has, hasn't been a problem generally speaking for for administrations. Um, and um, and and as as Ambassador Tai is considering uh, the administration's approach uh, moving forward, I, I think those uh, the the expansion, the adjustment, uh, and the uh, the enforcement need 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 to to achieve more equity uh, with, with each other. Thanks, Scott. Laura, um, I, I would just like to add one small but big point. Um, I don't the, the um, American companies that I work with. I don't know any of them that think that it's a good thing to buy a good from a foreign company that uses forced labor, for example. I, I think everybody would agree that that should not happen. And so the, the thing that matters the most to them is how do we come up with a solution? How do we come up with um, um, rules, if you will, that are workable and that companies can actually implement in a positive way? So, you know, how do you trace back that cotton all the way to the farm that came in in um, the inside of a, of a suit pocket or something, you know, it, you have to come up with something that, that can work um, if it's going to be effective. Uh, but I don't think that companies are in general are, are opposed to the notion that we need to find a solution to these really horrible things that are going on. Thanks, Laura. Any further comments? All right, um, before we open it up to questions from the audience and uh, as Ken noted, feel free to uh, send your questions to Ken in the chat. Uh, let's have one final question. Uh, and this one, uh, last but not least, is for Scott. Um, so, all right, here we go. Uh, Scott, you've been a strong proponent of the Section 232 tariffs. Last month, Ambassador Tai stated that the U.S. and the EU would work to lift the tariffs by December. In your view, what would a worker-centered, inclusive agreement to lift the tariffs on EU steel and aluminum imports look like and could the same template be used to lift tariffs on imports from other friends and allies of the United States, like Korea and Japan? Thanks, Alex. Um, so I, I, I do want to say that uh, yeah, Ambassador Tai, the administration, has uh, been in frequent consultation with the steel industry and steel workers uh, about this, much, much to their credit. Um, I don't know that it's a foregone conclusion that those tariffs are going to be lifted before the end of the year. I think that a, a, an enforceable agreement uh, one that's going to address some of the underlying issues uh, must be in place before that occurs. Um, I do want to say that, uh, you know, notwithstanding steel consumer complaints, uh, the, the tariffs have been working, uh, have been working reasonably well. Um, uh, the steel industry has been able to uh, invest $15 billion in making it more competitive in the United States, it's added jobs. Um, you know, if you talk to steel consumers these days, uh, the biggest issue uh, for many of them, notwithstanding supply chain whiplash um, due to due to COVID, uh, is is finding workers. Uh, and if you look at uh, quarterly earnings, uh, steel consumers uh, are doing quite well. Um, and so I do think that uh, we're we're in a position of strength uh, as as we move towards the end of the year on this. I think Europe needs to show much more willingness to stand up to China and it's unfair trade practices. I don't think, while Europe is certainly a friend and an ally, I don't think they've been nearly aggressive enough in confronting uh, China's practices. And they have to be an equal partner uh, in the United States in, in being willing to do that. I will also say that uh, you know European countries aren't angels when it comes to steel dumping. There are 40 uh, dumping and subsidy cases uh, against uh, uh, European uh, countries for, uh, for, for metals, for steel and aluminum uh, that are in place uh, right now. And I would further add that even with the 25% tariffs that are in place uh, in the United States, uh, there is a lot of permissiveness. Uh, there is a waiver process. We've excluded uh, a number of countries already. Uh, in any given month, maybe 30, 35% of the steel coming into the United States is subject to 
that 25% tariffs. Uh, so it is not the behemoth that many of the critics make it out to be. And even with those, the 25% the, the tariff, uh, the US steel market is still relatively more open to imports than the European steel market is right now. So Europe could certainly do more with respect to procurement openness, uh, to encourage domestic demand, uh, to stop transshipments, uh, and to confront uh, China uh, and other, uh, other countries that are in a position of massive global overcapacity uh, before, uh, before we lift those, those tariffs or consider further, further measures with respect to the Asian economies that you mentioned. Got it. Thanks, Scott. A, a lot there to chew on. Um, let's see, Eric, do you want to respond to uh, Scott's comments about what a potential 232 deal might look like? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I would just I would just say that in in my discussions, I, I guess I want to add a little international piece to the the 232s here. Um, I, obviously, it's a domestic uh, enforcement measure that that was taken. Um, I will say though that when I've talked to our partners, um, our trade union partners in in the UK, in the European Union, um, you know, the there's an understanding uh, that you know the problem is Chinese overcapacity and 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 dumping, um, and they're they're being hurt injured by that same overcapacity and dumping. Although, as Scott points out, in some cases they have their own um, uh, subsidy and, and subsidies and dumping going on. Um, but there's you know, just the point here is that a multilateral solution is is really necessary and called for and. Uh, and I, I was, I just been struck by how many times the, our, our, the steel workers over, you know, in the UK or in, in the EU, um, where, you know, we have agreement with them, despite the tariffs that are, in, you know, uh, in, in existence right now that, that, you know, the issue is really, uh, is China. And, and Eric, just to put a finer point on that, what, in your view, would a multilateral agreement look like? I mean, you allude to dumping and subsidy issues, but we have our ADCVD rules to address that. Um, but as far as a, a global agreement to address or a coalition, a willing agreement to address, uh, to address uh, China overcapacity, what would that look like? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say, like, I, um, I, I don't know that I have the specific uh, civics exactly how it would function or what it would do. I can only say that given you know, the number of countries that are being injured by, you know, the Chinese uh, overcapacity and dumping in, in steel, not just steel, other other products as well, that, you know, a multilateral solution is, is, is called for. I don't think that the U.S., despite the size of our economy and our political weight, that we are going to be able to, to wrestle the type of reforms that we need to see in China from them uh, on our own. I think to your point and to Scott's point, the Europeans really need to jump in uh, and others. Great, thank you for that. And, and I appreciate your answering the follow-up. Uh, Laura, Gordon, any comments from you on Scott or Eric's uh, remarks? I would uh, just mention one thing. I think um, Scott's absolutely right that we need uh, Europe to be active here. Uh, it's hard for me to see that happening without U.S. leadership, and I think that a lot of where this can happen is the World Trade Organization. Uh, taking on China really requires a multilateral response, and the last administra uh, administration spent a lot of time and energy trying to undermine the WTO as an institution, and its dispute settlement mechanism is an important way of addressing not all of these issues. Uh, the Chinese overcapacity in steel is something that is going to be hard to address in that framework, but many of these other issues, and that would strengthen our ties with, with Europe. I don't think it's a mistake that the administration hasn't clarified, that the administration has two things it hasn't really clarified, its worker-centered trade policy and its approach to China. Uh, those end up being intimately uh, interlinked. Thanks, Gordon. All right. Ken, do we have any questions uh, that folks like to ask? Uh, thanks, Alex. Actually, we've had quite a few come in, and I'm happy to encourage more. Um, Eric, uh, going to jump in with you, but welcome, obviously, the others to uh, weigh in as well. A um, couple times we've referred to the USMCA. Um, it had a couple of really, um, one might say, revolutionary provisions 
in um, that agreement uh, that I think those of us who've been around the trade world for, for many years were quite uh, impressed that, uh, if you might press might be the wrong word, uh, surprised maybe, um, found interesting in this uh, agreement, uh, the rapid response mechanism, which we've discussed a little bit, um, as well as you know something I think that's not gotten as much attention, the um, new labor value content rule, uh, which for the first time put a minimum wage essentially in a free trade agreement. Um, I can say with fairly great certitude, if anyone had raised that, even uh, six or seven years ago during the Obama administration, they would have been laughed out of the room, almost like a Nixon going to China moment by getting um, uh, President Trump, getting those provisions in the agreement. Do you see those as precedent setting? Are they, are they replicable in other trade agreements that the United States may negotiate or renegotiate with any of the, the many countries we currently have free trade agreements with? Yeah, um, no, I, I'm glad you raised that. I, I, Look, the, the labor value content provisions, I think you're right. I mean, they are they are extraordinary. Um, and I think they are repli rep replicable. Um, I mean, they're, you know, they're they're they exist because obviously the, the strategic importance of the auto industry in North America, um, you know, the well-founded concerns we have with uh, wages and standards in Mexico, um, as evidenced by the recent GM case. Um, so I think they're there for a good reason. Uh, I think the jury's out on uh, their impact. Uh, you know, it's still early days of USMCA. Um, I think there'll be a lot of uh, data analysis um, and, and number crunching by people smarter than me, <laughs> frankly, uh, to see how they have impacted companies' supply chains and their sourcing decisions. Um, uh, but, but yeah, I think there's no reason why they that couldn't be replicated in in a future agreement depending on the sector depending on uh the, the trade partner anyone else want to jump in on their thoughts on on those uh those provisions and whether there's something that maybe we should be uh seeking in our other trade agreements um i i will i think it does crucially depend on the sector i can't imagine doing something similar for textiles or apparel for example Mm -hmm. we, 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 we had a, a, an interesting question, uh, maybe following up um, with the, in the textile and apparel area. Um, and it, it sort of relates to, um, you know, if, is there a, a rationale? And, and if the, I guess we could, let me rephrase the question slightly, because the question's a little vague in, in the, in the Q&A, but and I'm just going to try to rephrase it a little bit. But, um, you know, every American, uh, wears uh, uh, shirts and shoes. Um, and uh, that includes work, people who are working and people who are not. You know, is there any, um, what, is, what would be the impact on American manufacturing of clothing and shoes if we were to eliminate all tariffs on those? It's thought by many that those are fairly regressive tariffs or regressive taxes on workers. You know, are there, what is the value? Is there a way of even measuring what the impact would be of eliminating the tariffs on shoes and clothing and what that impact might be on, you know, the number of American workers that might be impacted? Laura? Um, well, I'll jump in because that's my favorite subject. <laughs> um, maybe somebody, maybe the person who sent it maybe had that in mind. Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure who sent it, but um, uh, we obviously think when you look big, it's going to have a net positive impact because so many consumers, as you say, wear shoes and clothing. And so the ripple effects, I mean, just look at, look at how excited everybody is about the $300 they're going to be getting today in their checking accounts because they have a child six years or younger and they're getting this tax credit now. Um, if, if that kind of a, of, a, of a kickback to the American family is meaningful, then saving them up to 30, 40% duties on some of those products, like footwear tariffs are huge. Some apparel products are huge, especially for synthetic products. They're in the 30% range, they're enormous. And when you, when you add in the ripple effect of that tariff as it works its way into a retail price, it gets bigger and bigger. So they really matter um, to the end price of the products that are sold on, on retail shelves. And if you can get rid of those, it's a huge 
tax relief benefit to American consumers, which has spending impact, which in turn has job impacts. Uh, Scott, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I, I don't know that it's as simple as that because there's a lot of factors that go into the pricing of this, uh, not the least of which are uh, branding by not multinational companies uh, and the value of that uh, or shareholder returns that are expected. Uh, and so to place the burden on American factory workers to suffer job losses for this, uh, if you're not asking shareholders uh, or big companies like Nike to do anything, I think is a little absurd, I will just say. Um, so an interesting question comes in. Um, we've had a couple of them. Again, I'm trying to kind of consolidate and please keep sending questions in if you have them. Um, you know, which, which workers are we talking about? Um, this conversation today seems to be very manufacturing centric. I hope we understand, Scott, that's uh, the area you work in for sure. But um, services workers, uh, agriculture workers, um, you know, I understand that the Labor Advisory Committee is, um, I don't know if it's exclusively, but uh, I'm told in the question at least that it's, um, it, they're all, everyone a member of that committee is union representatives of the Labor Advisory Committee, yet only something like 10% of American workers are actually in a union. So how would, how would a worker, should these other sectors of the economy be reflected in their priorities and needs in a worker-centered trade policy. Anyone want to jump in? Jump in, on? Eric? Please. I can get cut on that. Um, uh, look, I mean, um, I think our a worker-centered trade policy uh, has to be thinking about clearly all workers. I mean, uh, unionized, non-unionized. I mean, uh, you know, um, that that is. I think no one is even arguing that. Um, I think, but it also needs to think about, uh, we would argue the workers overseas um, who are, you know, in making a lot of the products that we are importing and enjoying. Um, and I think it's critical that our trade policy, the standards, the enforcement mechanisms that we have um, help lift up standards and wages in those countries and those workers um, again, the idea of building the social floor beneath global competition. Um, and I think the US uh, trade model deserves some credit for this. Uh, when we look at our trade deals and we compare them to the European unions, our standards are more enforceable. There, there are more teeth in our trade deals uh, than, than the European Union has. Um, and I think this is a good thing. And I think that we're hopefully going to continue um, down this path of, you know, having enforceable standards that we can use to address uh, labor abuses wherever they're happening with our trade partners, um, even in sectors where we're not producing those goods. Um, you know, people often say that oh, this, is, this is protectionism on the part of the US unions. We have used our trade enforcement mechanisms to help workers stand up overseas in sectors that with which we're not competing with them. You know, it, it, palm oil production, things we don't even make, cocoa. Uh, so I think that that really, you know, that it's really short-sighted to think that um, this is all about, you know, uh, unions just protecting what they, what they have. And I know our, our focus is quite a bit broader. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks. I think I saw Scott. Uh, let's go to Scott and then Laura. Sure, thank you. Um, so, just you know, a, a couple of points on that. Uh, I mean, I think there's a rationale for a focus on goods uh, in the tradable sector uh, because that's who trade impacts the most. And some, but not all, of that is manufacturing. We rightly point out some of that is services, some of that is agricultural, but manufacturing jobs, I think almost uniquely, 100% of them are in global competition. And so having, uh, having an outsized role uh, in trade uh, makes, makes a bit of sense there. Second is this question about the composition of the Labor Advisory Committee. And um, you know, if, if the questioner supports the PRO Act uh, and other enhancements to the right to organize, I'll give it a little more credit. 
otherwise I, I detected a little dig in there. Um, but but the, the, the fact is this, you know, black workers in the United States were never closer to pay equity with white workers than when unionization uh, was at a peak uh, and when before the onset of globalization and trade agreements. And so if we want to achieve equity, uh, if we want to rebuild a middle class, having those voices at the table is essential uh, to accomplishing those goals. Uh, thank you. Uh, Laura? Thanks. Um, I, I completely agree that we have to um, talk about all jobs when we talk about trade. And we, as policy, as policy advisors, as policy makers, we are not just responsible for what happens in the manufacturing sector, as important as it is. We are also responsible for promoting, protecting, enlarging, enhancing, making better all jobs in the United States, including those in services sectors. And so that's really a, a fundamental theme of the kind of, of the research that we do here is where are those jobs and how are they impacted? And, and in a way, TAA actually recognizes this to the, to the, degree, the degree that it, it provides benefits to services sector jobs that are related to manufacturing job losses. I would, I would argue that as Congress considers revising TAA uh, and making it better for the 21st century, that it also consider making TAA available to workers who lose their jobs to import restrictions put on by the United States or to retaliation by foreign trading partners in reaction to tariffs imposed by the United States. Why are those jobs any less important than uh, a manufacturing and related services job tied to just imports? Um, so we need to think bigger and we need to think about all of the workers in the United States and all of the sectors and we need, to, if we're going to protect one with job benefits, we need to extend them to the others. I would just argue it's only a matter of fairness. Um, and a, another question, I'm going to go back to Laura for a second, then maybe bring in Gordon if he has some thoughts on this. Um, question comes in from a good friend of WIDA, Ambassador Tony Wayne, um, asks about, you know, do, do we have the, the data uh, needed to actually measure the impact of uh, trade, the estimate the costs and benefits for both workers and consumers, unionized or not, farm and, farm and agriculture workers. You know, the system, you know, I know, Laura, you made a good living trying to, to decipher the data. Um, but, you know, are, are, is it possible to make, you know, policymakers and the public better informed about the impact of our trade policies by having better data? Absolutely, we need better data, yes. And, and even the census data that we collect on imports and exports, it's all estimated. I mean, everything, every data piece that comes from the US government, it's not, except for the census, except for the every 10 years when we go out and count noses, everything is estimated. Our services data is horrible. Our services trade data is horrible. Um, it, 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 we need better data. So the analysis that we're able to do today, while it's good and it's 100% better than it was when I started in this business, it, it, yes, it needs better data. It still gives us a good order of magnitude um, for, um, for, for trying to um, decide whether there's, whether the net pluses or the net minuses of a particular policy action, it's better than nothing. Uh, but sure, of course it could be better and hopefully it will get better with time. We also suffer too, not just US data, but foreign data is, there's a lot of lag in it. Um, the coverage of it isn't universally the same. The product sectors covered aren't the same. So there's, there's you know, a lot of work need, is happening in this area um, and hopefully it will accelerate and make, make, make our estimates even more and more um, realistic. Just to, to echo that point and also to kind of tie in uh, some, some issues that, that Scott was raising just a minute ago. If we look forward, um, the vast majority of the job growth that's going to be generated by trade in the US is going to be tied to services and not to manufacturing. Uh, that's because it's service exports, which are the most dynamic part uh, on the export front in the US. Not to ignore manufacturing uh, uh, by any stretch. But if we're, our trade policy is not dealing with barriers in trade and services, we're missing significant opportunities. 
it is very hard to get a handle on trade and services and how it impacts people in particular communities because services don't go through a port. Uh, goods do go through a port, and so we measure them uh, much more easily. Uh, and so this is a, is a major blind spot for us if we want to think about the ways in which other countries' trade policies and industrial policies and other domestic policies are impinging on U.S. Uh, export opportunities, services is where the action is happening. Um, we have a couple of questions. There, there's some big picture questions that have come in. Again, I'm trying to tie a few of them together. Um, related to international labor standards and how that can help American workers and workers abroad. I think um, we've actually had, a, the, the discussion today has been very focused on American workers, but um, U.S., when we traditionally have talked about trade and labor, the trade and labor tie-in, it's often discussed uh, workers internationally and raising international labor standards. You know, is there a role for the World Trade Organization in establishing and, and making enforceable uh, uh, minimum labor standards as part of WTO conventions, not just ILO conventions, um, and bringing those two those things together. And is that even possible when um, developing countries, you know, have very, some different um, uh, priorities in in their uh, engagement with the international trading system? Anyone want to, Eric? Please. Yeah. Um, well, I, the, the short answer is. Uh, Yes, I do think that there is, you know, a role for the WTO to play, um, uh, frankly, on both labor and climate. Um, the, you know, these two issues have kind of been left out of the global trade model, um, and both are sort of knocking at the door now. Um, as countries get more serious about um, excluding products or taxing products, that are produced in a, you know, with negative externalities, whether those are environmental or social. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that at the WTO, it's very hard to get anything done, <laughs> but uh, I do think forced labor is a very good starting point for the WTO to take action. Uh, if you just look around the, you know, not only is the awful problems that I described early, earlier, but I think there is a global consensus on, on forced labor and human trafficking, or at least one would hope, um, that products produced with that uh, shouldn't be uh, in the global marketplace and that countries should be free to take strong action um, to uh, exclude those products. Uh, uh, and, and I think the WTO could, could really facilitate a discussion on that. Um, so, so maybe an opportunity there. Anyone else want to weigh in on the international labor issues? Um, we're actually, oh, Gordon, please. Just very quickly, uh, you know, this is a tough issue for the WTO to take on um, when the WTO can't get much of anything done. Um, but I think, I think Eric's exactly right. Forced labor should be an easy one to address that then creates a foundation to do, um, to do, to think more broadly. And when we talk about forced labor, issue number one on the table today is Xinjiang. Uh, so this is also a mechanism for galvanizing uh, other WTO members to take on uh, China's most egregious behavior in the international marketplace. Um, I, I'm going to close with, and we're already at the bewitching hour, so I just appreciate your indulgence because I just want to get to this last point and just see if where you all think this fits in. Relates to trade adjustment assistance, it's been brought up by a number of our discussants in a variety of ways where it should be eligible. Is, is it time take the word trade away from that. And Scott, maybe I'll, I'll start with you on this and have it be a broader adjustment assistance program for workers who are displaced for any reason. And, you know, should that even be something that could be potentially part of this, you know, work, this package of, of, of social uh, uh, issues that are addressed in the, the budget that's making its way through the Senate right now? Thanks, Ken. Um, first, it should in no way be linked with any trade expansion or TPA uh, as it has been in the past because it's been used as a bargaining chip there. I, I, I'm open to, to that idea. I do think that uh, even though up until this point and up until the pandemic, the TAA benefits had been relatively more generous than other types of adjustment assistance, they still were not nearly enough. Uh, and I think finally, 
uh, if there, there, there are really no silver linings to the pandemic, I think, but I think there's an increasing awareness of the need to build a better safety net for people in the United States and their families who are vulnerable. Um, and so I think it's a good time to have that conversation. And I do think that in addition, obviously to trade, there will be other types of jobs displacement. Uh, uh, and so it's, I think that if that can produce a greater result for workers and for communities, then let's have at it. Yeah. We're gonna find a, cons I see Laura nodding. I, are we maybe gonna have a little consensus moment to end our session? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree completely. I think it's just, it's gotten really hard for a lot of workers to be able to say, here is the import that caused me to lose my job when it more often than not is, is a mix of factors um, on any given moment. And then as I've suggested, I think too, we need to start thinking about workers who lose their jobs because of, of, uh, of, of, of an import decline or an export decline. There are all kinds of ways that trade um, affects workers and, and, and technology affects workers and um, changes in the market affect workers. And we, it's just too hard to delineate them all. And I think everybody should, should have a crack at getting the, the, the support, in particular, the training that they need, help training so that they can transition to these jobs of the future in the services sector in many respects. Excellent. Gordon, I, I, I know um, your paper covered a lot of ground and I, I believe this was one of the themes that I, I think was there as well. Uh, we, one of the things we know best about the labor market is that job, mar job loss is scarring and it's scarring whether you lost your job because of an import, a robot or a virus. What we also know is that those scarring effects are made more intense when you lose your job in the middle of mass job loss in your community. And so another component of making assistance not conditional on the cause of your job loss is also making the scale of that uh, assistance conditional on what's happening in the broader labor market in which you were employed. Fantastic. Thanks. Eric, any final words? Uh, no, this is great. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Uh, Alex, uh, thank you for moderating our session. You're also a WIDA board member and a font of great ideas for us for programming. Scott, uh, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, uh, Gordon, thank you so much for joining us. I hope we can have you and Eric as well back again. And Laura, who is a, a winner of WIDA's Lighthouse Award in the past, uh, we are a pleasure to have you back again as well. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, we're very focused here at WIDA on trying to get uh, help, help uh, our members understand what a worker-centered trade policy and um, what trade and environmental issues we can be look, look like in the future. Um, we wanna be a, a positive voice in that conversation and look forward to following up with all of you again. If you're watching this, wherever you're watching this, if you have availability to get the vaccine, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's the best way for our economy and our workers uh, and, and our people uh, going forward. Thank you all very much for joining us today. We hope to see you again soon.